Good Friday afternoon or evening, wherever you may be. Thanks for joining us live here today. Victor, how are you doing? Good, good, good. Good. Moz, Friday. Friday Moz good. is here. What is up, hey, Moz? Moz. Uh, the, it is Friday. And we were talking before we started that we're both ready for the day to be over. <laughs> Depends kind of looking we at we what We didn't say the word... Huh? Ready for the for upcoming Monday? Yeah, that's I'm I'm ready for Monday. I'm just not ready for today, and it's <laughs> already not even halfway or halfway over. So anyway, uh, just in case you don't know who we are, my name is Darren Pope, and this over here is Victor Farsik, and we're the host of a podcast called DevOps Paradox, which releases on Wednesdays at 6 a.m. Eastern, and uh, we do this Friday show just to I don't know. Stay away from the office for a few minutes. Is that one way to That's think about a good it? One. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and typically, we we start the day with some cheers. Here, let me get my face out of there. So today is orange. It's not really orange. I wish it was. I, I need to talk my wife into letting me buy Fanta. You know what Fanta is? Uh, um, come on. <laughs> I, hey, it's a valid question. I don't know if Fanta is like a, an international drink or not. Oh yeah, Fanta, Fanta, Pepsi, Coke, all that okay. stuff. Except Dr. Pepper. I think that that's the only one that is not, not here. Yeah, okay. So Moz said, nice t-shirt, Victor. What is the t-shirt? Because I can't see the mic. Uh, Cube Sphere. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll actually, uh, let me get rid of that. Okay. Yeah. Um, How did you get swag so and not go to, did you actually go to an event where you got swag? No, 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 they sent it to me. Oh, okay. Okay. It's kind of like door-to-door uh, -door delivery. Nice. I like it. So you didn't have to leave to get swag. That's exactly. That's amazing. Okay. That's the best way to get the swag. No effort. Zero. Zero effort. Okay. So let's, since we were talking about the podcast, now StreamYard, so we use StreamYard to do our live streams, and <clears throat> which was good for you yesterday when we did your live stream on DevOps Toolkit. Because, because I lost internet. On me? I disappeared, <laughs> but it kept going. So that that's exactly. a good thing. But they made a change this week. <coughs> and I want to see what it looks like here. So typically we go to here, right? We're used to seeing this. Mm -hmm. But there's a new one now that is this. I like the other one more. Yeah, I do too. Well, kind it's... This the is confusing. Where, where am I? Where am I? Oh, there. Okay, there, there. Ah, cool. Yeah, so... That's that's what I'm thinking too. I just wanted to see how that looked. But anyway, uh, let me finish resize. So I was doing that resize. So that just came in yesterday after <clears throat> we finished. So it was like I, I went back in to do some cleanup, and I was like, wait, that wasn't there before. <laughs> uh, how to develop microservices? This was a listener question, and uh, I don't even remember what the answer was anymore. Do you? Don't um, do it. Just to let develop don't monoliths. Do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Sounds like that. Yeah. Oh no, this was the fully local, fully remote or hybrid. That was that was the basic oh, okay. question. It's embarrassing. We don't know what we talked about. <laughs> well, this one was honestly this one was recorded probably six weeks ago. Oh, so it's two been weeks a while. Is maximum. Maximum. Yeah. yeah, speaking of which, I don't know if you checked your calendar or not. I added you for something on Wednesday. So I saw it, I accepted, I didn't see what it is. That's fine. That's that's all you need to know. Um, okay, so anyway, how to develop microservices. What should you do? Fully local, fully remote. I tell you what, I've we've talked about this offline and we've talked about it in public. Uh, I've been using Gitpod a lot over the past couple of weeks uh, just for some day job type stuff, for demos, and it's amazing. Absolutely amazing for that. I'm I'm falling greatly in love with Gitpod. It's just, it's amazing. And now you're making me mad, right? Why? Because uh, I tried to convince you about that, like, what was it, a year ago? And now you're coming back with Gitpod is amazing. It well, took me a year. it took me a year. And I will say this in public, I haven't made the final decision yet, but I'm really close to not renewing my JetBrains subscription next year. 
If you I ask re- me, I, that has nothing to do with Gitpod. It has nothing, nothing to do with, with Gitpod. It has everything to do with VS Code actually having everything that I need for right now. Yep. And I know that I could always go back to JetBrains if I need it because the personal pricing is not that bad. So it's I'm, I'm not getting as much value. I'm not saying JetBrains isn't valuable. Please don't, don't misunderstand me there. But for how I'm using it right now, it's not as valuable because I'm not doing that, that type of work day to day. I think that the key point here is not whether JetBrains is awesome or no. Actually, JetBrains is awesome. But it's more about VS Code being everywhere. Uh, you're likely going to uh, stumble upon VS Code in multiple places, one way or another, right? Uh, many platforms have it baked in uh, online, offline, this and that. And then it's so much more convenient to have one editor that you use in many different places than to switch from JetBrains to Visual Studio Code. Because Visual Studio Code is almost unavoidable. You cannot avoid it anymore. And then it kind of muscle memory. You build a muscle memory around one of those instead of two. I, I honestly believe, and it just hit me, that I think my big mental block was that it was Visual Studio. Using that phrasing just brought up all sorts of really bad feelings in, inside of me. And I just couldn't commit to it. In my case, is the other. That's curious. In my case, is the other way around, because mm. my mental picture of Visual Studio, uh, Word Visual Studio, is Visual Studio that I've been using like twenty years ago. Right. You know when Eclipse was just starting, just yep. just at the very beginning, right? And Visual Studio Code was absolutely the best thing at the time. And I'm talking really long, long time ago. Probably the time when many of the people listening to this did not even start writing code. Uh, it was out of this. It, it's completely. I, I remember when I first, uh, when I was forced by a company to use Eclipse, I was kind of like, man, this is this is torture. This is, I cannot do this. That's how big of a difference it is. So even before JetBrains, or I believe before JetBrains. So yeah. I have those how they can nostalgic. Yes feeling about it. Then came afterwards Microsoft that, that I disliked and almost everybody in the world disliked. But right. I still have the, 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 that image from before, the dislike era. Okay. And we'll be coming back to VS Code again at some point. You see, it's everywhere. It is everywhere. So uh, speaking of being everywhere, Anais, got this amazing top ambassador from CNCF. Now this happened right after we went off the air last week. Went off the air, we're not like we're on TV. Uh, but when we finish up the show last week, she posted this, that there she was. She's the top dog. So on Ace, you gotta come back on one of the shows at some point. Of course, you know, she may be blowing us off now because we're just, Nah, that's the problem, kind of like he, he, he was uh, hanging out with us in the past, but now now she's, she's too much of a celebrity, I think. Okay, so Anais, <laughs> the gauntlet has been thrown down. Well deserved. Yes, very well. Well deserved. Uh, we were just talking about VS Code. This came out this week, vscode.dev. Have you seen this? I saw it yesterday, but I saw it on my mobile. Uh, kind of, I was excited to see what it is, and uh, I wasn't around the computer, and I saw it on my mobile, and it looks great. Looks Basically, great. Of, uh, I haven't used it yet in depth, really. It is a lightweight version of VS Code running fully in the browser. Fully. Yes, but I suspect, and I'm repeating suspect because I haven't used it yet, that that's not good enough anymore. I, I, yeah, yeah? I, I don't Go think ahead. so either. Because now we're having uh, solutions like Gitpod, for example, which basically use variation of VS Code as well, that give you much more than uh, ID. It give you a full development environment, right? It's running together. Your tools are there. Your applications can be running there. Kind of like it's a full deal. Basically, it's a you're getting equivalent of your laptop there not only VS Code, right? 
Now, VS Code Dev might be doing that as well. I haven't tried it yet, but I suspect it doesn't. I suspect it's not giving you all the nice things that, let's say, Gitpod is giving you. Yeah, and what Moz was saying here, it could be a WASM play, I think. that's. I think that's probably reasonable to think about. But yeah. it, you can already see here that it runs fully serverless. Okay, you can't get out of one post with somebody saying serverless. It feels like it should be a drinking uh, game. Uh, you know, a development tool that can run fully in the browser. What, what does serverless have to do with that? Um, <laughs> local development with cloud tools, blah, blah, blah. File system, a lighter weight experience. I, I really wish they would have, I mean, they talked about all the coolness of it, and I don't disagree, but who is this targeted to? I mean, I, that's the one thing that they didn't really call out here. You know what's also confusing is that this comes from the same company that gave uh, gave, gave us uh, what's the name GitHub Spaces, mm -hmm. Code right? Spaces, Code Spaces, Code Spaces, and this looks like a like a subset of Code Spaces. Yeah, and which I'm trying to get down here. So many extensions for VS Code work with source code that's in GitHub Code Tour. I don't know, but then it's like. You can make quick edits, review PRs, and continue on to a local clone or even better to a GitHub code space if you want more powerful. But so, okay, so it's code space light. Sure. Right? In a way. Yeah. I just don't like those things. That, that, that's my main problem I have with AWS. If you have too many offers around the same thing, then it's confusing for me as a user. Yeah, it is. So this is a very long uh, post. It's not that long, but long enough. And who knows? I mean, it might be something that could be useful for certain things. I, it just, with the work that I'm doing right now, I, I would be questioning if this would work or not. But because you still need local file system access, you need all those things and. I'm trying to get off my, if I've got a good enough pipe, I don't want anything local. Yeah, but I, I don't think that you necessarily need local file system access because no? the idea is that your project is in Git. So everything that you have local working on a project is in Git, right? Yeah. So that's equivalent to local file access. I'm more concerned of whether I have everything else be, that I need uh, before, before and after I write code or something, right? Yeah. Th that's why I'm talking about I would need to have the tools if I'm writing Go. Does it compile Go, right? Does it deploy? Mm -hmm. uh, does it package it as a container and deploy something and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Luna Paint. I haven't seen that. So you can actually do all that inside of. That's weird. Okay. Anyway, VS Code Dev. That is that. Uh, one other thing I saw here, we mentioned this last week, and they actually came out with a blog post about it this week. Uh, Source-based deployment in Cloud Run. Uh, it was beta back in this, you know, almost this time last year. And now it's just a, a one step. You say, uh, where is it? There we go, run deploy. That was using the image, but now the deployment mm -hmm. is just run deploy, Source. Done. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying you, to you, wrap my head around whether this is good or, or not. Well, it's using build packs. So it's if okay. if you're okay with build packs and that works yeah. for you, then that should be okay. Yeah. It's yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I, That's it's the just, target users. Well, it's like when we build the website, we're using Hugo on Netlify, right? So that's a source build. Now you can't really compare. It's it's a very different thing, but it's comparable, right? Or at least it's analogous, even if it's not comparable. So source. Right. Stefan, you are welcome. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Stefan. If, thanks for the question. And if anybody has more questions, go over to the Slack workspace and add questions 
wherever. You can DM, DM them to us. You can put them in Hub or in the podcast channel. Um, you're being very quiet on this. I'm wondering if you're being reserved because... No, I'm, I'm trying to kind of, uh, you know, uh, trying to figure out what are the target users. So if target users are a user like what you just said, you know, like us updating the site for the podcast, I think that this is absolutely brilliant. Now, if, I, if you're talking about more serious, bigger team, then I'm, then I'm mentally trying to figure out where does this fit into the life cycle of an application, kind of like, and whether this is really helpful or no, or 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 not compared to having Docker file, right? Given mm -hmm. that there are quite a few other things that we need to do when we're doing things at bigger scale than our website and right. with bigger team and stuff like that, right? Uh, I don't have an answer to that. I'm just kind of like thinking, uh, thinking about it. Yeah, I'm because this sort of feels the build pack concept feels very much like Elastic Beanstalk in the old days prior to the Docker existing. And it's like, here's my job app, and it would take care of bundling and building and deploying and doing all the things. This is that next iteration just from with a Google spin on it. Here's the question, for example, right? Okay. Uh, and and the answer, the positive answer can go either way, right? Do you run it and test it locally first, right? And it's perfectly valid answer to say no. I go directly to Google Cloud Run, and then it's great. Or the answer can be no. I do actually run it and test it locally first, or do something with it locally. And if you do, then source source doesn't work for me. Right, because I yeah. need to have a way to do those things locally. That means that I'm likely going to have a Docker file and build an image, or maybe run the application directly. If I run the application directly, then yeah, fair enough. Source to so, source to Google Cloud Run works fine. But if I'm locally building image just to run it locally, then all of a sudden it's not a good idea anymore. But it's good to have options. So yeah, it's a positive yeah. thing. Yeah, to me it's. If I'm following a staging model, so dev stage prod, I don't want to build for each environment. I just don't. It just, that's, if I've done security scans, I've done all the things, it's it's just a, to me, that's a bad smell. Exactly, but, but so, so that's why I think that the use case for this is, it goes directly to production, kind of like there is nothing before production, like our website, right? You're not deploying it to staging Netlify, right? Uh, no. Probably. <laughs> exactly. So it goes directly to production, then it then it's fine. I think it, it's fine. Yeah. There is nothing wrong with that under certain uh, certain circumstances. Yeah. The uh, let's move on to Pulumi had their uh, conference, if you want to call it, it was a one day conference on Wednesday, and this was leading up to that, to where they now have a Pulumi registry, and to me, this is effectively what. Terraform has in their registry, right? I have a That's... question for Pulumi. I, okay. I think that this is an absolutely fantastic, uh, good move. What took you so long? What took you so long? That's the question. I, I, it's I, positive. It's a positive development. It's very positive. I've reached out to to Joe, who, who's been on the podcast before, and I haven't heard back from him because hopefully he's taking the rest of the week off. But I hope to get him back on to talk about this and other things that have been going on in, in Pulumi, just because... They've uh, they've been doing a lot this year across across the company, so it's it's interesting to see that they're. Oh yeah. Maybe it just took them to get to this point, right? It's just one of those. It's on the list. We want to do it right. We don't want to redo it. So maybe they just took their time. So Plumi Registry, all available. Now the question nice. is: Is do we completely abandon Terraform for Plumi? You know my opinion, right? I know your opinion. And I'm also biased, so that I'm, I'm trying yes. to avoid answering those questions. Yeah. Now, this is the one thing, I can't remember if we talked about it or not. They they launched the AWS native provider, which is built on top of the AWS cloud controls, which what gives I you day and date availability. I think anyone building APIs today has to follow this model. Has to. Because... More or less... Now, 
going back to what I said like 10 minutes ago about you know, when, when I was saying confusing, now I have VS Code Dev and we have Code Spaces and kind of, the same problem is with AWS. AWS needs to figure out, hey, is it now, uh, what's the name, CDK, ACK, uh, the, the DDK, oh, CDK, whatever yes. K? CDK, uh, exactly, yes. yeah. and then cloud control API, kind of like which one are you investing in, which one do you want me to use, kind of, kind of like please tell me. Kind of, uh, AWS has a problem of having too many things and it's so hard for a user and especially for a vendor to see kind of like, okay, so what should I invest in, right? For all I know, maybe CDK is the thing and not uh, connect, right? Maybe. Moz has the question of what's the advantage of Pulumi offer over Terraform? I'm not going to call it an advantage. I'm going to call it a difference of opinion. Terraform is HCL, full stop, right? Yeah, it's declarative format for declarative your only. infrastructure. Yep, exactly. And Pulumi is with a sprinkle of programming okay. inside of HCL, yeah. sprinkling it, right? Very little, very little. Yes. Pulumi, on the other hand, is full on pick your language of choice that's supported, TypeScript, whatever, and then start writing your definitions. Correct. That's that's the and I'm not gonna call that an advantage. It's just a difference. Some people Correct. if you have I think it's gonna matter to the how do we say this? I think it matters what type of people you have working. If you have a bunch of people that are just real programmers and can't think declarative, then Pulumi may be the better choice. Exactly. So it's, I, I, I agree with what you said. Uh, not, we're not talking about advantages because realistically, Pulumi and Terraform have the same approach to managing infrastructure, right? So neither of the two companies is changing the game. Uh, the differences, I mean, of course, there are feature differences and all those things, but on a high level, the difference is how you define infrastructure, not how it works conceptually. Right. And the way that Mr. Givaden is bringing it up is you can use the same language. And that goes back to my point of if all you have yeah. are JavaScript developers, then that makes sense. I don't doubt that at all. That's just a, I think it's a better choice. Mm, maybe a better choice. I'll put it that way. Yeah, I mean, there is there is slight kind of like, and I'm nitpicking now on language, right? Uh, use the same language for your app and infra, right? Now, what do you mean by app? If you're talking about code of the application, yes, 100% agree. If you're talking about defining how your application runs, then uh, that might not be the same anymore, unless actually you're deploying your application with Pulumi as well, which now I would say that it's a stretch from my perspective, not Pulumi, but Terraform as well. I, I don't think that they are great tools f uh, to deploy your applications, um, but I might be wrong, right? Uh, so uh, if it say same language to define, an app, def and I'm using the word define an application and infrastructure, then it might just as well not be. The one thing though that is pretty good is if the registry doesn't have a native provider, you can use the Terraform bridge. So that's, yeah. this is this is good. So uh, I'm actually looking into this a little bit too. So it's, uh, it's it looks interesting. That's, that's where I'll just leave it for right now. Uh, breaking. As, in, as of yesterday. Nginx custom snippets allow retrieval of ingress Nginx service account token and secrets across all namespaces. Is this a good or a bad thing? Uh, I mean, when something starts with CV, uh, when the title starts with CVE, it's never a good thing. Yes. It's also been classified, I believe, as high. Yeah. It affects. One zero zero and anything less than forty nine. If you're using in Ingress Nginx, um, you might want to check it out. Now, this is the reason why I wanted to go ahead and bring this up. 
if you were to scroll through all this, and the links for everything will be down in the show notes. In fact, I have a new way of managing that. So hopefully right after the show, I can get it updated or within the hour. Uh, your shirt was CubeSphere. And CubeSphere actually already has our CubeScape. Or is it CubeScape or CubeSphere? You're CubeScape. What are you? What shirt do you have? Uh, CubeSphere, not oh, CubeScape. Okay. Not, CubeScape, okay, no. send me the t-shirt and then I will be CubeScape as well. Okay. Anyway, it... Actually, is Cube, CubeScape is already calling out, and it's really freaking hard to see. Uh, it's already calling out the CVE. So, nice. all right. Well, what did I do? Oh, it opened a new tab. Okay. So anyway, and uh, these are always fun to see, especially heading into the weekend. Okay, but so we just need to upgrade Nginx. Like that would not cause any problems. I mean, we just need to upgrade Nginx to cover other problems. We need to upgrade Kubernetes. How hard could it be? Um, <laughs> no, let's not go there. Okay, so if you're running Ingress Nginx, you might want to check this out. Uh, okay, so, oh, we've got some tooling. Do me a favor. Mm -hmm. Since you have a mouthful of soda right now, give me a thumbnail picture. Okay, that's good enough. Thank you. Because um, I always forget about that, and this is always seems to be the right time for me to do it. Crane. <laughs> um, so I look at this logo, and that's not a crane. That's a flamingo. <laughs> but I'm going to let that slide. I'm going <laughs> to let it slide. So Crane is being put out by the people at Prime Hub. Mm -hmm. Do you know what Prime Hub is? No idea. I can only guess it's another registry, right? Oh, that, yeah. that Prime Hub. Okay. Yeah, this Prime Hub. The one that Excellent. doesn't actually load. Actually, I'll try it again. Yeah, end of file error. It's been years since we got Let's Encrypt. How can this even happen? I don't know. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, we'll just go back here. Anyway. So magically, it's a new way to manage and build images. This looks really familiar, doesn't it? I don't know. What is this? Is this like Docker Hub something something? That's what it feels like to me. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, it's a UI, right? To manage and build. But it doesn't say if I have to install uh, Docker. Is it, I mean, this is, it's just talking about the UI. I would have to, I would imagine I have to have Docker or some other <laughs> builder under the hood. So, so here's a new year's resolution for me. I'm going to ignore absolutely every similar solution made by people who still do not understand that it's a container image. Next. Got, Apply to everybody. Yeah? If you yeah. do not understand that you're building container images and not Docker images, I don't want to even try it. Yeah. Um, well, they don't say Docker images here. Yeah, go, go, go. First sentence. First sentence. Oh, well, up, it says up, build up, new up. image no, no, here. No, no, no. Go, go, go. Up, up, up. First sentence in that read. Did I miss it? An easy and beautiful oh. way to. Okay. All right. It said lowercase, so I missed it. Since it was lowercase, I just sort of kept on going. <laughs> Okay. Yes, I agree. All right, let's let's move on from that. Uh, Snowcat. This was interesting. Mm -hmm. A service mesh scanning tool. Now, specifically, it's just Istio today. Gathers mm -hmm. and analyzes configuration of an Istio cluster and audits it for violations of whatever. Hmm. Sounds like a rules engine, doesn't it? Hmm. <laughs> um, and it goes through the Istio best practices and. You can install it, but I think the, all right, here, let's, this this gets into some very obtuse type weirdness. Down in this readme is a link to a blog post, which actually explains what it really is. Uh, cool logo, by the way. That is a cat, cool. and it's in snow. So that fits. It's There's not a crane. Course. There's a horse. I don't know if that's a horse or not. That's a good question. Um, and why would a horse be on uh, whatever those things are called? <laughs> I don't live in the part of the world where these things exist. So, 
Okay, so anyway, what this is, there was a big, here it is. So Snowcat has two primary goals, to obtain information about an Istio deployment and to report on misconfigurations or deviations from best practices where possible. Again, sounds like a rules engine, doesn't it? Um, it only reports on, well, excuse me, not only. Uh, mutual TLS, unsafe authorization policies. But again, look at this definition. The definition looks pretty this familiar, doesn't it? Huh? It's OPA. This is OPA, exactly. I mean, not That's... OPA, OPA uh, objectives. Right. Um, now, whether it is or not, I'm not saying that. But it goes through all the different things, and the usage mode was interesting. You can run an authenticated mode or static analysis. Now, this was where I was it sort of caught my eye. So you can either figure it out using all the things here, or it can scan static YAML files. So, you know, I think this, this I think this is what this sets us apart is it's either a live tool or it's a static analysis tool. I don't see that very often. Do you? I mean, I think the snake is doing that. You think so? I mean, static analysis, yeah. Oh, yeah, they're uh, definitely doing, but doing doing it live too. That's what I haven't seen them do. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so, yeah. true. But he, here's the thing, I really cannot, I cannot have fifty seven different scanning tools anymore. Kind of, so this is my message to to to, to Snowcat or whatever is the name. Kind of like, hey. Uh, let yourself be purchased by somebody, maybe Caverno or Gatekeeper or uh, Styra or uh, somebody kind of like, I, I need to reduce the number of, of those scanning tools because if I need the different tools to scan thing, every single different thing that I have, I need at least 57 of them. That, that, that's my problem. I think it's a cool thing. I, I, I think we need this really. Uh, I haven't seen it in action as well, but at least conceptually we definitely need this. But this to be part of something bigger. Yeah. And am I too negative today? I don't think so. Um, so let's figure out who Praetorian is. If it will, there we go. Security for a cloud. For, okay, so it's another security company. Okay, so actually, it's probably already part of their solution, and this is the open source, uh, the thing that they open source. Then that Correct. makes sense. Perfect sense. Yeah. Okay. Chariot. Oh. That's the uh, that's the reason why the horse is on the side. Do you see the little chariot? And it is a horse, then, after all. It okay. is, well, cool. I would have to assume so, since it says chariot. Yeah, of course. Okay, so this is a like legit. Okay, nice thing. Nice. So, but then, yes, they open sourced. Okay, people, make it easy to work and find things. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. Um, interesting. Okay, we'll just do that. All right, so that was. Uh, who was a snowcat? Snowcat. Snowcat. All right. Uh, how often are you creating new Go applications, Victor? Not very often. That's the wrong answer. You're supposed to work with me here. You're supposed to be saying I'm doing it at least once a week. Uh, every morning when I wake up, I create a CLI and then I get coffee and have breakfast. Okay. Much better answer. So, this is a newish app. I'm saying new because it's been around for six months, at least from here, but really active. Uh, it creates a production ready, don't know what that is defined as, project with back end in Golang, front end in JavaScript, TypeScript, and deployment automation. I about barfed when I saw Ansible and Docker uh, when running one C CLI command. I like the bootstrap idea a lot. Mm -hmm. And if, if this is what you're building, this is this is the microservice pattern, right? If I can say punch the button, give me the boilerplate, and I'm going to need more backends, I'll just copy the backend, right? Until I got the model built out and I'm good to go. Yeah. So I thought this was cool. I haven't actually gone through it. I've got an app I'm wanting to do probably in a week or two, and I'm probably going to use this for that just to see how it works. Nice. So it's just. CG app create and off it goes full demo the deploy ansible really um okay here we go again 
CLI command to deploy Docker containers for Docker containers with your project via Ansible to the remote server. Thank um, you, positive. <laughs> I mean, this is this is more, most yeah. likely one of those yeah. projects, and I and I think that that's absolutely great. That was that that's something that that team, those people used for whatever yeah. they're doing uh, outside of this project, and they open source it, and that that part is nice. I like that, right? There's probably no intention. This is not a commercial something. There is no kind of ambition yeah. behind it. It's just hey, this is what we're using internally for what, and we're going to open source it and. Hey, if you don't like Ansible, add another one. Do another one. Yep. So you look at the back end. It's a back end template with Golang, which gives you basically a REST with CRUD and JWT, or with Fiber, which gives you more. And you have some different flavors for the front end, which actually, that's cool, right? You're not stuck to yeah. React or Vue or whichever ones there you're being thrown under the bus to run. Skip. Yeah. No, skip. <laughs> skip. 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 <laughs> <clears throat> So anyway, that's it. Nice. Uh, Why not? And they are licensed under Apache. That's great. Uh, do do do. And logo is under Creative Commons. Okay, got it. Okay, so going from something really big to something really small. It's called Ready. I saw this this morning. Okay. It's a per now. It's really small. Literally, really small. Like that's it. Mm -hmm. It's a program to run task before a commit using a pre-commit git hook. Right? Uh, so it's from your laptop. It's not the pre-commit. Right. Oh, okay, nice. So, yep. okay, okay. So it's not like GitHub action type of stuff that mm -mm. Uh, will run something. Uh, with... Okay, nice. Nice. This is local. It, it's confusing that it says pre-commit git hook, right? Right. It's if I understand right, the rest of this description is not really pre-commit git hook. It's uh, hooks into your CLI, right? Correct. Maybe. Or maybe it is. Well, let's go down there. So you have to you have to install it. Okay, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, then you say a ready init in the repository. Mm -hmm. So then it's going to do magic inside of the .git directory. Fair enough. And then you need you need to create a tasks file of what's going to happen. So in this case, it's going to do a format and do a lint. Fill in the blank, nice. whatever you want to do, right? Doesn't matter. And then, the, they, he actually has two examples here. So you, if you do a git commit, you'll see an output of running tasks, whatever. And then, you know, however you set it up. So then, before it even hits the commit, you can short circuit. Nice. You have these things obviously built into GitHub, but that means it's already left your machine. Exactly. Exactly. This is nice. So this is about as left as you can be, I think. This right? is kind of normally I, I I was doing something very similar to that, but in my case it was make file, right? So instead of doing git commit, I would have uh, make I don't know git which would run different tasks and then bit committing and, and pushing to a Git repo, right? So this is a replacement for my make file, in my case. Right. Or shell script or whatever you would be using to kind of like change certain commands and then with git push. Yep. And then you can also just run ready by itself. So mm. if you don't want to even go through the git commit, again, you just run ready and it's going to read that YAML file. So if you want to do that as a pre-bake for you, and then you could do your git commit if you wanted to. I mean, there's the nice. workflows are very reasonable. So th I thought this was very cool because this can be used in all sorts of ways. The so. only thing is, can you go down? Mm -hmm. You're probably like, okay. Please don't make me install it. Go install. Well, no, you don't. I mean, you don't have to. You could go. I mean, I think that's how they have it defined. But no. Nope. Oh. I mean, especially since this is written in Go, it's so easy to create binaries in Go for all operating systems. It's, it's extremely easy. It's, it's no-brainer, right? I think it's time for a pull request. <laughs> of course, he, he, well, he's not using any kind of build tools, meaning none of, none of the typical automations. Fair enough. Of course, he is on GitHub, and it is 
MIT'd so he could safely use GitHub Actions, right? Exactly. Maybe he's just more concerned about getting it right first and then he'll hook it up. That's reasonable. Yeah, it's it's, it's super early. I mean, if you look yeah. at the commits, kind of it's 13 days, 15 days. The probably first commit was 15 days ago. And yeah. uh, there's been six commits. In the six commits, yeah. three Total. releases. Yeah. First commit, add task info, add new lines, wording, file path. Yeah. I think it's cool, though. I think it's very cool. Yeah. Oh, he, cool. Just, he just did something two hours ago. What did he do? Oh, the file path. Oh, okay. All right. That is ready. Now, going from something that I think is super cool to something I am not convinced of. Kubernetes. What is it? Oh, okay. We saw something similar, right? Didn't we, did. we see a few weeks ago? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't remember which one it was, but yes. Now, just because Helm sucks, does that mean we need to ignore it? Let's not get into that right now. <laughs> um, sounds like Pulumi. Yes. So what's Kubernetes? Kubernetes is a library that used to generate Kubernetes YAML files with ease. Are you in agreement that Kubernetes YAML files should just be generated? I think so, but... Okay, that's what I'm saying. I don't think that YAML is sucks, and I don't think that YAML is complicated. Now, what we are defining as YAML, let's say 57 silly Kubernetes resources are just too much, but that's not the fault of YAML. Right? That you have complex something, something Kubernetes, for example, is not more complex because of YAML, probably, or at least not much more. Um, and th but this reminds me of YTT, in a way. Oh, yeah, that does. It's like, here's a hello world. So we import Kubernetes, set the namespace, set the selectors. So, this looks like uh, freaking look, YAML. This looks like YAML. How is this any better than YAML? Oh, uh, it's I, not. I honestly, I honestly do not understand. This is more complex than if I wrote YAML. This example, I'm not saying that there are no cases, but actually it helps Agreed. a lot. It simplifies yeah. things, definitely. But this is the example from the repo, right? So I'm going yes. to take that example. No, none of those things, uh, I, I see no help here. I, I see no simplification. I don't understand. Maybe code complete, right? OK, there, there you go. Maybe maybe you get co code complete. I mean, not maybe. You do. Um, I, I don't personally use much code complete, but I'm pretty sure that you have code complete for Kubernetes YAML as well. I, again, this is the hello world, and I'm looking at this as like, uh, this is two YAML files. I have a pod but, template, have a deployment. <laughs> I mean, nothing the, against the, the tool, but don't, I mean, it's fine to show us a basic, and you need to show us a basic, but don't make it look like. <laughs> that's kind of, uh, I think that both, this is very similar to my experience with Pulumi, is that there are almost certainly many use cases where Pulumi shines. But then when you go to official examples, kind of like, the, the getting started example, I, get, I got the same employer hashing, kind of like, how is this better? How is this easier? How, why is this better than YAML? I mean, you look at the example, right? Now, when you go into use cases and when you figure out, you find out that, yeah, okay, there are actually situations where this helps. But why don't you show me that situation in an example? That's, that's, that's my question, kind of like. Well, here's where it's um, a complete non-starter for me. You must have Node.js installed. It's not going to happen. Same like previous one. Please compile by it. I don't yeah. use J JavaScript for a while now, but I know for a fact you can compile it into a binary for operating systems. If you're deploying, if you're giving someone a tool it needs to be self-running. Correct. For not only for your end user, but for yourself. Because if you're expecting an end user to get a runtime correct, it, it may work. That's me. I'll hang it up. I have spam. You want to see spam? Mm -hmm. There's spam right there. Um, uh. <laughs> the 
If you have the ability to produce a binary, you should produce a binary. End of story. Correct. Right? Just, just because. <sighs> anyway, yeah. I'm going I'm to let that and, go. And it's still, if, if and when I need this, I will use Pulumi. I don't need this. Yeah. yeah. Again, I wanted to at least give them, because it looks like they've really given it some thought. And it's fine, but it currently seems to be a one-trick horse. It generates Kubernetes YAML, and that's it. Pulumi does it as well. Yeah, and I have a lot more people behind it probably than the people here. So exactly, I, that's what. I, yeah. Again, nothing against it. If it works for you, great. Ask me to install a runtime, especially something mm -hmm. like Node. I mean, Java. Okay, I've dealt with Java for twenty years. Plus, now, how many old is it now? 25. Um, that's not a big deal. Node? Hmm. Okay, M30, I'm going to move on. Or actually, it's M30. It's not M30. Uh, <sighs> now, I, I will not be able to concentrate on what it is until I figure out what is what are the three letters. It's M30. I mean, it's, it's o. M3 letters O, right? Yes, yeah, lowercase. Look or up here in the letter. URL. No, it's O. It's lowercase O. Look in the URL. Anyway, and so I'm still trying to understand what this is all about. I'm still not getting it, but it's an open source public cloud platform. We're building an AWS alternative for the next generation of developers. Next generation of developers? All right, so when they go through the story, blah, blah, blah. Okay, here we go. It's hosting 35 plus services and counting. Below are the platform features. You have a dev UX. Okay. Uh, first word of warning, don't say a slick new UX. <laughs> don't say that. Uh, one token, use one micro API token to fulfill all your API needs. The corollary to that is you lose that one token or it gets uh, compromised. All of your mo money is going down the drain. Fast access, that's fine. Free to start, that's fine. Anti-AWS billing, okay. We'll look at it here in a minute. And then open source software, okay, that's fine. So they go through all, and again, I don't have anything major against it, but there are some weird things that I'm going through and looking at. So there's a cache, a DB, functions, stream, user management and file storage. And then you have some logistics, whatever that really means, and then web. But when we go and take a look at it, it's open stack, right? I don't know. I mean, open stack like something. Open stack like. I, I'm getting yes. confused. I, I assume it's kind of like having AWS like type of services. Yeah. Self hosted. Yep. So here, so the the thing that is a big plus is that it is all API driven. Nice. Thumbs up. Right. So I'm, I'll, I'll give them the do on that. I can go through here and look at it. I can see where the service is defined. It is open source, so I know exactly what they're running. And then they break out pricing per feature, per endpoint, <laughs> which is cool. And I want to go to one more just because. I'll pick database here real quick. So database. I want to count the records in the table. OK, well, that's free. So to run select doesn't cost me anything. Uh, if I want to update a record, it doesn't cost me anything. But do you start seeing the granularity problems that are happening here? Um, I still don't know what it is. That's my problem. Yeah. So let's get to pricing. <laughs> so the majority of our APIs are free to use. Right? So look up a postcode, you got to pay eight and a half cents. Now, they're paying for the data, so they probably have to pass that on. Those databases are not cheap, so I'm not going to fault them on that. That's expensive. Yeah. Crypto, they're charging for that. They should. Email, sending. Okay, there's a cost to that. So they're listing out every one of these things. And these are prices per request. Um, how is this any different than AWS? Yeah, I don't know. Other yeah, than some things being free. Now comparing prices and saying this is cheaper, this is more expensive. Yeah. 
I, I, st I, I honestly still don't understand what it is. It's a platform to where you could build an application. Let's go to the getting started. So you could build an application using their using their platform. So kind and, of their and cloud some provider of, in a way. Correct, and they're it's it's a okay. purpose built with some with business stuff already in it, like the postcode lookup, or there's services okay. like database and whatnot. So okay. Uh, the majority of the okay, and, but this is the other thing too. I'm going to zoom this one in because I did not zoom this earlier. The majority of micro API. So this is their branding, micro API. So to do a count is a is an API call. To do a so everything's through an API. The majority of APIs are free during the beta period. Third party APIs or calls that perform blah 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 are charged for. Again, that's fine. Any request made to a pay API will debit dollar long. Okay. So anyway, but my, my problem is here are free during the beta period. If I was to try to build something on this, and now they've come out of beta and now they're gonna start charging for everything, that's the concern. That's the I'll use the word fear. I mean, I don't know, assuming that those prices that will be after beta are listed and there is a certain commitment yeah. to the prices. I mean you can try it out at least. Yeah. I assume that if it's better, right? We're not talking about you using it in production yet. It's it's about trying it out and yep. then saying hitting go when they go out of beta. Yep. I just don't see how you can say it's an open source AWS alternative. That's I think that's the problem. I think it's yeah. kind of misleading all that. Uh, when you said AWS alternative, my first reaction was okay, so is it kind of something like OpenStack? And I'm realizing it's not something like OpenStack. It's not right. AWS alternative, just a set of services, right? Powered by micro, micro .moo. It must be far away because it's taking a long time to come up. Is an operating system built for the cloud? What? I thought we already had Again, one of those. Messaging. Get get somebody in marketing to 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 rewrite the messaging. That's that's my message to them. Whatever it is. So M30. Oh, I did it again. M30. Micro. Ah, oh, micro. That's micro. Okay. M30. Okay, you don't you don't need to shorten five words, uh, five letters words. Micro is okay. Well, micro is there, but the platform is M30, which. Yeah, but M30 is a short for micro. Yes. That's my guess, and I think we both came to the realization at the same time. <laughs> okay, uh, let's talk about your video for this week. Developers need everything. Everything, right? They need to know everything. Yeah, I'm on a, on a crusade, on a mission now uh, to kind of... I'm very focused on shift left. And right now I'm in a mood that actually the, the most important thing for shifting left is to create services for developers. Uh, we cannot we cannot expect developers to continue opening Jira tickets whenever they need something, and we cannot expect developers to figure out everything that they need to do something by themselves. So there must be a middle ground solution, create services for developers, whether that's a service to manage infrastructure, to deploy your applications, whatever, right? And this is pretty much in line with what big guys are doing. If you look at look at how Google operates, if you look at how Netflix operates and so on and so forth, they all do the same thing. And they have teams that are creating services for other teams in, in those companies. Uh, so uh, all the people, operators and then whatever else, security people and so on and so forth, start creating services that others can consume. That's the message of this. But isn't that what we should have been doing all along? Yeah, but sometimes you need to repeat it because the message did not pass through. Yeah. <laughs> and probably never will. Okay. So, KubeCon is over. KubeCon was pretty much a non-event this year, I think, right? Yeah, so it was funny. I was thinking KubeCon in person, and it was a good thing. Uh, all the people I know that went there gave me the same message in-person part of KubeCon was an event uh, for vendors only and contributors, right? So basically, there was almost nobody in person there. So it was 
Imagine a, a hall where all yeah. the vendors have stands and the only visitors to stands are other vendors that have stands, kind of like so. <laughs> circulating, all the vendors circulating between each other, which, which was actually, uh, from some aspect, it was kind of cool because, hey, you can, you can meet your colleagues from different companies and uh, core contributors and stuff like that. So from that perspective, kind of, it sounded like something cool. It sounded like something that we should be organizing, actually, kind of like, as a way for all of us that are working for software vendors to meet. Uh, but on one, every, any other aspect, it was a ghost town. Well, it seems like there would be a cheaper way of doing that instead of going to a big conference. Just post a, okay, here's where we're all going to meet up. All right, and we'll see you. We'll see you there during these weeks. We're going to do another one in a, six weeks after that. We'll see you there. Exactly. Sort and... of, it's sort of like DevOps days, except for vendors. Yep. Right. And without the hundred k investment in right. <laughs> in being a sponsor, <laughs> slightly oh, cheaper. Uh, I would say much cheaper than that. I actually <laughs> looked down at my clock, and my clock has stopped, which is weird. Did 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 we just have like a an earth shattering thing happen? I'm looking at a different Maybe. clock, and it's still moving, but my other clock is like completely dead. Um, <laughs> Okay, so you've did you have an event this week? You had yesterday, which I actually Last didn't pull week, it this in. Week. No, this week. This week. Uh, no, 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 no. Had... No, we had DOT yesterday. Had... We had DOT yesterday. Yeah, we had uh, yeah, we had live session AMI session yesterday. And I think I had only one event this week, which was yeah. private event, so uh, Yeah. Easy. Can I talk about it, yeah. It was private, so you can't talk about it being private. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I could tell you, but then the internet would implode. Um, <laughs> uh, it was, to be honest, kind of like it was. Next week is going to be hell on earth again. But it was so nice after the previous week to, to have a week to kind of like, okay, now I can rest for a while and then I can go through all the hundreds of emails that are in pending state, snoozed until this week because of the last week. Yeah, I need to do that too. Uh, okay, so I think that's it for this week's show. And we're back again next Friday. Next Friday is going to be the Friday before Halloween. So bring candy, which means I need to go buy candy. Um, oh, I have... You have, you have well, a, a young child at home. Of course there's candy. Oh, yes. Yeah. Saturday is going to be, we're going to go to... It's called Port Aventura. It's local. Inter yeah. How do you call that? Uh, you know, rides. Yeah. Type of park. Disneyland. A fair of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of Disneyland without Disney characters. Right. <laughs> Let's call it that way. <laughs> so next Friday will should be fun. I hope. Uh, and then the week after that, we'll be back with another AMA for DevOps Toolkit. So if you want to start getting in your questions for that, Slack Workspace. That's crawling down below. If you're not. Uh, joined up there yet. That's completely free. And uh, I think, oh, we didn't say it. You crossed 12, you cr you crossed 12,000 this week or 11,000, 12,000, right? On 12, subscribers 000. on your channel. Yeah, but I, I, we crossed 10,000. Uh, Whatever. Two months right. ago, month ago. And now right. the next announcement will be 20,000. 20, kind of. I, right. I cannot go now for a thousand right. anymore. Well, I'm it using that just because you, well, but you but you crossed over you crossed over the next thousand barrier. I wanted to say that, but then this channel finally crossed over a thousand. Ah, this channel. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. So I, I'm saying yeah, I was, I was is... it's like this one's a very slow burn, if you will. Very yeah. slow burn. <laughs> Different content. But steady. It's it is steady. It has been steady for two and a half years. So it's and it's interesting to see. It took us what just over two years to get to a hundred thousand downloads on the podcast. That we track that can be tracked. It doesn't count YouTube or anything. Uh, but since then, we're right at one hundred twenty thousand since two or three months ago. So we've added twenty thousand downloads, which is pretty good. So it's just right. yeah, it's not rocketing, but it's it's going along. So for everybody that listens to the podcast, we thank you. For people that watch this live or watch the replays, thank you. Uh, and remember, next week is the Friday before Halloween. Please bring candy. I will go find a. I'll have to, I need to go write it down because I'll forget to go buy candy because that's something I don't buy. So, okay. 
Uh, I think that's it, right? So we're, we're done done for the week. And uh, have a great weekend, everybody. And we will talk to you again next week.